So welcome to the C string safety meeting. So at this meeting, we are going to talk about how to be safe with C strings. And while they might not present much of a safety risk immediately in the physical world to you, they do present a serious safety risk to pretty much any software system that you use them on. Even today, you hear about all these bugs and all these horrible things that happen in commercial software. A huge percentage of these are due to improper use of C strings. A huge percent of these types of bugs. So today we're gonna to go over a couple of different common bugs and that are caused by C strings and how you can avoid uh, things that are likely to cause these types of bugs. So first of all, let's do a quick review of what exactly a C string is. So a C++ string, if you've used, if you've done C++ type stuff, a C++ string is an object. And it's an ob and a, it, so it has a lot more to it. However, a C string, a C string is incredibly simple. It is basically just a block of bytes where each byte has a single character in it. So the, there's a, care, a variable of type care pointer is used to declare a C string. The care pointer contains an address which evaluates to the first block of this, the first byte of this block of memory. The C string then continues throughout this memory until it hits a null terminator, which is a byte with the zero value. Bytes with zero value, of course, do not occur in actual character data. So um, that indicates the end of the string. So, um, so, all, so all these bytes go together to form a C string. Any questions about how this works? No? All right, cool. So you might also hear about wide character strings. We don't really think about them in rocketry, but you do use them in like desktop applications somewhat. So that might be what, that's what happens when you need to support like Unicode and where character, a care, a W care T might actually be uh, 16 or 32 bits wide. But a regular C care is always guaranteed to be eight bits wide, which is really a problem a lot of the time. But we have to deal with it at this point. It's legacy from 50 years ago. So there's a couple of major flaws with the arrangement of C strings. So the biggest flaw is that there is no way to find out how long the C string is other than just going through the string and looking for a null terminator. What happens if there is no null terminator? Bad things happen, that's what. Other thing is that there's no protection against reading or writing beyond the end of the string. If you get an index wrong, you accidentally access the wrong thing, then bam, you got a memory error. There's no types of protection, no bounds checking, no nothing. I mean, there are third party tools you can kind of use to work around that like, um, for example, uh, Valgrind or address sanitizer or using a C, like a C library with bounds checking, C++ library with bounds checking. But out of the box, by default, there's no protection against that whatsoever. Uh, and then finally, our so string operations require calling C string functions. There's, you can't directly really do much with that care pointer variable. You can access the bytes in it. You can change the bytes in it, but that's it. You can't trim it down. You can't like pad it. You can't format it. You need to use extra functions to do these, these which are not directly tied to this uh, C string variable. And a lot of which are not built in and a lot of which are not safe. So the, there's, a, there's a couple of mistakes that really tend to happen very commonly with C strings. One of the biggest ones is false assumptions about buffer size, like accidentally not realizing how big a buffer is or not making your buffer big enough. Uh, there's confusing string and binary data, really easy to do when they have the exact same variable type. Calling unsafe C string functions, always a thing to watch out for. And finally, incorrectly allocating and deallocating memory. That is always a major worry. So how do you make false assumptions about buffer size? So suppose you have this code right here. This is very common code, especially in like older, like 80s, 90s, 00s, C applications. I have, I have seen way too many applications like this at my old internship. And one of my big projects was actually rewriting one of them because it was cancer. Um, so we just make a big a care, a character array. This is of course very similar to a care pointer. It's just think of this as also as a care pointer. Um, we print out, but then we use scanf to fill it with input the user types on the console. Then we take that input and open a file with it. Does anybody see what this code is doing wrong? Scanf can take an arbitrary number of characters. Yep, you got it. And uh, yeah, this percent %s, no matter how many characters the user types, 
um, they, it'll scan them in and it'll save them into this care array here. And uh, it doesn't have any kind of limit on how long that character can be. If, if they type more than 128 characters, it'll just write beyond the end of the array and into stack space, which is bad news. It's a little bit similar to what happened on Fathom 2, though it wasn't a scanf call. It was like manually accessing the array. And um, uh, it's a really common thing. And uh, I feel like 80s and 90s programmers just had a tendency to go, no one will ever type more than 128 characters. Right, right, yeah, that's what happens. And the, those kind, and then those kinds of assumptions like live or live in code bases for five, 10, 20 years. And then suddenly you get like a critical security vulnerability. A lot of times it comes from something very similar to this. It could be like, if, if you imagine this being over a network, the same kind of thing of just saving bytes without checking how long they are. It's very common to see security vulnerabilities to do with that. So there's a couple of, there's some good, there's some best practices you can follow to be safer about buffer size. So the number one thing is always keep track of how big your string's buffer is. Like have a variable that says, this is how long this string is, Pro probably a constant, or if it could be allocated to something variable, use a variable to store how long, how big this string currently is and make that a constant so you can reference it wherever you need to, either a pound defined or a const int, whatever works. And, uh, or const size t, excuse me. Um, and then you, when you have something that's declared to that constant, it's always good to um, base that constant on something. It's, I, I, I have a real pet peeve about people kind of just choosing a random value for something for these types of string lengths, because then it's difficult to predict when you might exceed that value, even if you do handle the error gracefully. Like if you're taking a path, like I think Linux provides the variable max path, which is the longest, which I think 256, it's the longest number of characters that can be in a path. That's defined in system headers. Use that if you're declaring a string that holds a path to a file. Um, like if you're declaring like something that holds like hamster commands, make the buffer as long as the longest command plus a line terminator or something like that. Make it so that the buffer size actually means something. You're not wasting space and you have enough space for anything you need. See, so you, you said, what exactly is a buffer? So a buffer going back would be something like this, like the blue boxes. The, these represents like how the buffer is the entire amount of space you've allocated to store your string depending though a variable amount of that could actually be filled with characters. So, um, and then also be careful of off by one errors when sizing your string, because like if you have a string to hold nine characters, you actually need a buffer with 10 spaces for characters because there's a null terminator after the nine characters that has to go into the buffer. So make sure to leave room for that null terminator. Your buffer always needs to be one bigger than the actual amount of readable characters you want to put in it. So um, C, so C kind of makes this, so now let's talk about binary data and string data. So C requires you to store both binary and string data as care pointer because in their not infinite wisdom, they decided to make care the only eight bit wide data type in C. So, it's, so a care pointer really just means it's an array of bytes and it's kind of up to you as a programmer to decide what that means. And it often leads to confusion over if I have this care pointer variable, does it hold a string or does it hold bytes? Um, so it can really be a disaster if you get the wrong idea and something that you think is a string actually holds bytes. So let's talk about why that is. So we got three different things that are all pointed to by care pointers. So my question for you is which of these is a valid, which of these is a valid C string? And, it, and which of them is just binary data with that's not a string? Sorry about my handwriting. It was starting to get a little cramped. Any idea? Do you think data one could be a valid C string? Is there restricted size? On the uh, yeah, we imagine the blue boxes are the entire buffer. The strings need that uh, slash O thing over there yes. at the end. Yeah, that is exactly right. So in order for something to be a valid string, it has to have a null terminator at the end of it. So this null terminator means there's no significant data in the string after this null terminator. So data three is a perfectly valid C string. It contains readable characters and it ends with a null terminator. 
Data two is kind of, it, it's not, it's a gray area. Like you can see, it just has numeric data. It would print garbage, like the zero X one and zero X are all control characters, but it does at least contain one null or zero byte before the end. So if you pass this to like printf, you wouldn't crash. It just probably wouldn't display properly. This, this is a disaster waiting to happen, this data one, because if you, it has characters in it, but if you pass it to a string function, there's no null terminator. It'll keep going forever past the end of data one if looking for that null terminator. So yeah, here's, so I guess, so this is, so our question is based on this previous slide, what happens if we actually try, I guess I kind of gave it away. What happens if we try to pass some uh, thing to this? And the answer is that bad things happen. So as I said, if we pass data one into a function that expects a null terminated string, printf could potentially go on forever looking for that null terminator and never return. This was actually the bug that happened on the Traveler, that we think might have happened on the Traveler 4 launch rehearsal, where it tried to printf a string that was not, didn't have valid data, and it hung the entire process of going forever looking for a null terminator, because we had the same bug recur in our testing when something very similar happened. So it's easy to get an infinite hang with passing those types of bad data. It's very, very dangerous. So you have to be very careful. So we do have, thankfully, some conventions for keeping strings and binary data separate. So the C library in stdint.h, or if you use C++, the bracket cstdint, unbracket, header, you have, it has typedef un, unsigned care uint 8t. So the sort of convention that I've always tried to follow in our avionics code, at least, is that for binary data, we use uint 8t. For string data, we get care pointer, or rather uint 8t pointer. And then string data is care pointer. So looking at those, so that'll help tell whether something is actually meant to be by a string or not. So Following our convention, if you don't have, if you have data that is not a valid string, it better be in a UN8 T pointer and not a care pointer. So to be safe. So now there's, so there's a couple of pretty commonly used string functions that are just plain unsafe. They're, they're not safe to use because they have, there's a couple of different issues with them. So I'm going to go over a couple of these right now and talk about how you can replace them or what you can replace them with and how that works out. So there's a couple scanf and fscanf sprintf, strcat, strcopy, those could all potentially write past the end of the buffer they're copying to. And then strcompare and strlen and strcat and strcopy could all read past the end of a string if you pass them something that is not null terminated. As, as I've said, this is a super common bug surface and also a super common attack surface for malware and like or for malicious programming. Like you pass it, you just convince it to try and call one of these functions on something that isn't null terminated Bam, it could potentially do anything, undefined behavior. So, um, so first of all, let's talk about str copy and str cat. So str copy takes the destination string it and it copies in characters from a source string. Don't ask me why the parameters are backwards. It drives me insane, but they are backwards. So you have your destination and your source. So this is bad because it could potentially copy an infinite amount of characters out of SRC if it's not null terminated. And also bad because it could copy because it could exceed the length of dest when copying characters in. So there is strn copy, which um, oh sorry, uh, strn strn copy is safe because um, you, you'll you'll know exactly how many characters you're copying out and how many characters you'll copy in. So that strn copy lets you provide a maximum number of characters to copy. So that maximum would have to be the smaller of the two between the length of src and the length of dest. So you can provide an upper bound on how many characters it can copy. Um, and then str cat appends them onto the end of dest instead of starting at the start of dest. So that's a little less safe because you have to also know how long the thing in dest is and whether the length of source plus the current length of dest could potentially go over the end of dest. So this one is so, not, so that there is str end cat, which lets you restrict the amount of characters copied over. So both of these functions, you got to do a little extra work to say what's the most characters it's safe for it to copy right here and then pass that in as the limit. Once you do that, they're safe, but you do have to be careful and don't use these unsafe versions of black. So for comparing strings, we normally have str compare, which returns zero if two things, strings are identical. That's it. Why? I don't know why it's zero. It's so weird. <laughs> well, that means you have to do if not str compare, it means they are equal. Well, okay, I kind of know why it's zero, which is that it returns like less than one if the left side is smaller 
greater than one if the right, or sorry, less than zero if the left side is smaller, greater than zero if the right side is smaller, or something like that. It's like Java compare to, where it could return one of three different things. It helps you sort them. But at any rate, um, it's unsafe because it doesn't, it, when it's looking at these LHS and RHS, it doesn't, it doesn't actually know how long LHS and RHS are. So it could potentially read forever. There's also another issue, which, is, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, so if you're copying null, if you're comparing null terminated strings of a known maximum length, you can use strn compare, which only compares characters up to a known max length. If, it, if the strings seem to be longer than that, it will stop and just compare only up to there. And then if you're comparing binary data, not strings, you have mem compare, which always compares an exact number of bytes um, up in two arrays up to a certain thing. So strn compare will stop if it sees a null terminator first. Mem compare will always compare the full length. Otherwise, they're pretty similar. However, there is another issue with um, str compare. And it was an issue that for a while was the bane of Nintendo's existence on their Wii console. So uh, the Nintendo Wii used this algorithm that I put here. I, I found like the sort of decompiled pseudocode um, this is pretty well documented. And it uses this to verify the hash of a game disk. So the idea is that when a game is published, Nintendo takes a hash of the contents of the disk and then they encrypt that with their, pub with their private key. So then it can only be decrypted with their public key. And then at startup, the console takes its own hash of all the stuff on the disk and then it decrypts the hash that was signed with Nintendo's key. And then it requires the two to match before the game disk will load, that proving that the data hasn't been tampered with. I don't, I, know, I don't know how many of you know much about like public key, private key cryptography. You learn about it in CS350. Just basically know that there's two different things that have to match that are very long. They're 160 bits long. So if you wanted to try and like mess around with the data such that the two things happen to match, it would require two to the power of 160 guesses to actually get those hashes to match if you were just trying it randomly. That sounds secure, right? Well, wrong. So consider what happens looking at this code if the actual hash and the expected hash have zero, have zero bytes in them. So as, so, and as it turns out, it turns out that it's trivially, trivially easy by messing with the signed hash that comes from the disk to make this be entirely zeros. So now what do you have to do? So, if, so do, you see what, do you see what's going on here, what the attack is? Anyone see it? So you have str. So you can see down here that strn compare is being used to compare expected hash and actual hash. Now they are using strn compare, right? That's safe, right? Because it's not going to go beyond the length of the hash, and they passed a maximum length. That part is safe, but it's using strn compare to check if expected hash equal to actual hash, and these are our two cryptographic keys that have to match. So what we want to do for the attack would be to get this to return that they do match and not go into this if statement but then actually have been able to modify the stuff on the disk. Anyone see it? Well, okay. Well, as it turns out, uh, if no one's got a guess, then so as it turns out, how it works is that then all they have to do is they mess with the data to make this expected hash be entirely zeros. And then all they have to do is try two to the eighth different combinations to make the first byte of actual hash a zero by just randomly trying different like filler data on the disk. And then the effect is that it's str comparing two things where the first byte is zero, even if the, the whole rest of the bytes don't match. So that means that those two things always match each other. So you can completely bypass the cryptographic check and load any sort of modified data you want on this console. This is the thing that powered a whole generation of console hacking, this bug. Pretty interesting, right? Let's see. Uh, so we can keep going and let's talk about sprintf. So sprintf is also very unsafe. So um, the buffer, um, so what it does is it takes stuff in format. It works like printf. It takes stuff in format, it takes arguments, and then it prints that into a buffer instead of printing it to the console. 
So this is a problem because there's no obvious check to make sure that the stuff you print doesn't exceed the length of buffer that you have here. So if you know the max length of the thing you're printing, you can use snprintf, which lets you specify the maximum length to write to the string. But if you don't know the max length, things get a little harder. For embedded devices, there isn't really a good solution, which is why string handling is somewhat difficult. Um, uh, yeah, Sam, that is, when, that is sort of how homebrew hacks worked on the Wii, at least the first generation of them. And then let's see, ja Jasper said, if, if dest isn't null terminated, str cat is still unsafe, right? Yeah, yeah, this is still slightly unsafe because dest, is, because dest uh, has to be null terminated. So str cat is not super great. Oops. So then, um, uh, uh, let's see. So when the max length is known, so use snprintf. If you don't know the max length, it's hard. There isn't really a good solution for embedded devices. For desktops, you can use the asprintf function which actually allocates the correct buffer to receive, to um, hold all the data and then returns it. So this of course uses dynamic allocation, not great for embedded devices, but it's super nice for desktop applications. You just have to remember to free the buffer that you originally got from asprintf. So as far as scanf, um, this is also something that can cause buffer overflows because um, how it works is it reads stuff from this S standard input, as we saw earlier, it reads stuff from the standard input and then stores it in arguments. You don't really have to know how this works. It's a little bit different than printf, but basically if you pass it percent %s, it'll expect a string buffer and then it will write characters into that string buffer. So this is bad because it could potentially write an unlimited amount of characters into that string buffer. That's not good. So um, how you have to do it is you, um, uh, you can put a number in the format string before the, buff the buffer. And then what that, num that number does is it will, um, uh, limit the thing to that amount of characters. This is a little annoying because the buffer has to be in the string itself. I believe there's some C, there's some C macro stuff you can do to like take a buffer that's take a size, a number that's in a pound define and then turn it into a string constant and then merge it with the existing format string. Kind of like how those PRI U32 things work similar to that. But, at, and then, but that's kind of outside the scope of this. Another method, not for embedded devices, is to use percent %ms. So it'll, it'll work a bit like asprintf. It'll automatically allocate a buffer of the right size for the data that you get. So both of those are a lot safer than just using scanf on its own. So finally, a couple rules about memory allocation. So uh, this is, of course, a broader topic in C. And Jay, as Jay suggested earlier, it might be good to also do like a safety meeting about just memory allocation in general. but it's more specifically about C strings. If your function is getting a C string from some other function, make sure to remember who is supposed to delete this string because often it's not very clear. Is it you? Are you supposed to delete this string? Should you be deleting this string? Make sure to always know that when you're working with the C string. I've seen some dodgy code in my time. And if your function is returning a C string to somebody else, make sure that it says in the comments whether the caller is supposed to delete that C string, whether it gets deleted by something else, is it global? Are they supposed to call regular free? Are they supposed to call something in your library? Make sure that it's documented how to delete the string that you return from your function or if you're even supposed to delete it in the first place. Now I will say to help with this, there is a bit of a convention that exists, which is that um, if a function returns a const care pointer, that means you don't need to free the return string. This is adhered to by most things. I don't know if it's 100% stuck to by everywhere in the C library and all software projects, but it's generally at least a good hint that you probably don't need to free it. You should always back it up by looking at documentation. And they actually did change the type of C literals, of string literals in C++ from, from C to const care pointer in order to adhere to that more because you definitely don't need to free something that's a string literal. So just keep an eye out for that const. And if you're writing something where somebody doesn't need to, somebody does not own the string, return it as a const care pointer. All right, that is it for our string safety meeting today. Uh, are there any questions? I do have a cool video for after this, but. Any questions about C string safety? Any questions about C strings in general? Just to confirm, this isn't only in C code, not C++, right? 
Mm, yes and no, because um, we actually use C strings all over the place in our avionics code, because C++ strings, which are objects, are not really a good fit for embedded devices like we use. So we actually have to use mostly C strings in our code. We don't, luckily, we don't do much string handling in the first place. We're not trying to make like a web server on our device. That'd be fun. But um, we do, for when we do do string handling at RPL, we do have to use almost exclusively C strings. I see, I see. Okay, that makes sense. And of course, C strings are what made Fathom 2 almost fail. So that's why we have to be so careful with this. All right, no other questions? Okay, and oh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna call the safety meeting for there.